here with Eric May of Pilot Malt House of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm great. Welcome. Tell me about this big pile that I'm seeing in front of me. That is 2,006 pounds of uh, locally grown, locally sourced uh, Michigan white wheat that we, uh, we picked up about an hour south of Grand Rapids. And what are you going to do with it? We will malt it into a delicious beer or delicious malt that will eventually be used in a half or a wit or, or otherwise. So. That's awesome. So this is, you know, you're really malting local products here as much as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all about, we don't own land ourselves. Uh, we, we work with growers. In this case, it's an actual mill. Um, but we, you know, we're all about giving growers an option other than corn and soybeans. And that's what we're trying to do here, so. Uh, would you mind walking us through the malting process yeah, so we can yeah. see what it's like? Yeah, no doubt. Uh, first, uh, first step after we receive it, we'll break that down. Um, fill this tank. It's just a standard intermediate bulk container. Everybody knows what these are but doesn't know the name. Um, 330 gallons. We'll fill it with water um, overnight and let the temperature regulate. We don't want to shock the grain too bad. Um, from there, we'll load in between five and 600 pounds of, of uh, whether it's wheat or barley. We're pretty wheat heavy right now just because of uh, the season. Um, let it sit in here for 24 hours or so, get some air into it to aerate it, and then drain it and let it uh, drain overnight and air dry. Um, from there, we move into germination, which is the, the crux of malting. So that's what this, this uh, bucket yeah. is, for lack of a better word yeah. here? Yep. Yeah, it's just the same tank that we just cut in half vertically and uh, laid it on. We usually set it on pallets, and usually there's two of them that, uh, back to back or next to each other with fans. Um, so each one of these, five or 600 pounds in here, gets split into two of these. So 250 to 300 pounds end up in each one of these. How can you tell when the grain is ready to move? Um, we, we do it at the same time every time. So we try to create some consistency in what we're doing. So that's just wanting to, you're tricking in to want to grow at that point. And then this is where we actually have it grow. Um, so once we move it in here, it's just wet and cold at that point. Um, within a day or so, it gets, it's starting to get hot and starting to sprout. And once uh, the acrospire, which is the, the most important uh, stem that grows or rootlet that grows, once that's the same length as the grain, uh, it's, it's ready to move on to the next phase, which we'll get to. But um, this is where it happens. This is where the, the enzymes are created that later create the sugars that help, along with yeast, create alcohol. So. Cool. What's the next step? Uh, from here, uh, we, we usually use a pallet jack to move it over to the kiln. Um, kiln's a 10-foot uh, by 10-foot. We feel like it's a behemoth, but uh, Brees does this on a football field. So... Um, you know, it's 10 foot by 10 foot. We use electric heat, terribly inefficient, but it gets us a product on the street. And um, we ducked it out, out the door. Um, everything the grain touches has to be stainless steel. So we made it, made a point, obviously, to do that. Um, yeah, uh, it goes about three, 600 pounds or so get, gets put in here um, and ends up being about six inches thick or so. And sits in here for 12 to 15 hours, depending on the humidity and the temperature, in, in both in the building and obviously outside too, so. How do you regulate the temperature? In other words, so what temperature do you shoot for and then how do you regulate it? Um, with wheat, we're typically at the 118 degree mark. All, all malt is essentially the same temperature until the last couple hours. Um, so if we wanted to make something dark, this kiln isn't set up for that yet. Eventually we hope to be. Um, but those last couple hours where you ramp the temperature up to make something chocolate, you ramp up, ramp up to 300 degrees. But we ramp to 170, 180 and that really cures our flavor. Um, and uh, yeah, wheat and barley are, are not too dissimilar in that, in that respect. But basically, we have a thermostat that regulates the temperature, turns the, the heaters on and off when it gets to a certain temperature. Um, and then there's a fan that's on another thermostat that does the opposite as well. So now, uh, who built this? We did. Yeah, uh, we were. Hey, this should work. And uh, um, buddies that are electricians, and we prayed that it didn't light on fire the first time, and especially the first time we left it go overnight. Um, I'm not an engineer by trade, but we, we decided we could be. We'd, we used things we saw, um, and we went cheap just to, you know, at the time we were just trying to do, make, a, make a run at it, but not go heavily in debt and stay married at the same time. So, um, so yeah, at the end of the day, it's, uh, it works. Every time we've gotten into this, into this uh, piece of equipment, it's, it's worked and, and tasted well at the end. So. Cool. So, yeah. okay, you've, you've killed the wheat. I mean, you dried the wheat, you've killed it. Now what do you do with it? Yeah, so what, like I said, we want it to trick it into growing, we make it grow, and then we kill it, is what we're doing here. Um, from there, it goes into the grain cleaner itself. Um, basically, just a, it's a farm piece of equipment that uh, knocks up, if there was any foreign material, it uh, will kick it up front. Um, it knocks the rootlets off that grew during germination. 
um, that we then give to farms. So just kind of buffeted it around? Yeah, this, uh, this shakes. I can turn it on. Right um, but it basically just shakes, uh, put some air through it to get, or down through it, I guess, yeah. um, to knock off any, any foreign material. Give us a real consistent product at the end and no foreign material at the end, which is, which is huge. So. And then where? And then it goes into, well, up the auger. So, um, we do 50, yep, up the auger, attach a bag to it. Uh, we do 50 pound bags, not 55s. Um, and then in, uh, one of our biggest customers needed it in the, actually back in these totes. So we, we delivered nine of those to one customer. And um, so we, uh, yeah, from there, and then it sits over on, on pallets until it goes, goes out the door. But everything that we make is already spoken for in about a month in advance right now. So, um, so yeah, all that stuff's just waiting for the, the actual date that somebody needs to brew with it and go from there. So what was the what was the most challenging thing about getting your company up and running? Um, learning, you know, we were all about uh, you know going around and talking to folks and trying to get smart on on malting itself. Um, the most challenging part was was repurposing equipment, uh, trying to figure out there, this doesn't exist on a small scale in terms of market commercially available equipment. You know, uh, you can probably get something from China, but we're not to that point yet. And so we repurposed it. We created the kiln from from scratch. Um, father-in-law was a huge help, you know, and, and just friends and growlers and beer and stuff and really got, you know, it's a, it's a currency of its own. So, um, yeah, you know, at this point we, we sell everything we make. Um, for the most part, everybody's pretty happy with it. We can, we can always get better. Um, but, you know, we, we have a good name out there. We push the brand pretty well and we hope to continue. So. How did you get interested in malting? I mean, a lot of the guys are like, they're, they're brewers. Yeah. But you're a malter. Yeah, I'm not, a, I'm, and I'm not a brewer. I, uh. I had a buddy who was a home brewer, and I had had about 17 of his beers, and I started asking um, you know, questions where geographically where beer came from. And um, yeast is science; I don't get it. Uh, water is pretty well taken care of here in Michigan, and I started you know researching hops and, and, and malt, and well, there's hop growers popping up. I'd rather be their friend than you know their their competition. And uh, well, there's only you know a handful of folks looking to do this in Michigan, and why can't we? And you know, obviously Grand Rapids is Beer City USA, and you know, I started to put feelers out there different places, and it's like, oh, I was really well received, and just kept moving forward, and that was two and a half years ago, and we just got licensed in August, and we got a six-ton order the next day, and we've added 25 more customers since then, so. That's a terrific, a terrific success story, and and so were you looking to just start a business? You were kind of looking around for something to do, or it just fell in your lap? Yeah, I, I am a 12-year uh, military veteran, and uh, I was sitting in a portage on in Iraq in 2007. Who hasn't? And uh, and I thought to myself, there's this is not this is not my thing anymore. And um, you know, I I've always been a life I've been a lifelong entrepreneur, just trying to figure out how I could do things better or, or different. And um, you know, it came to the point where like, you know this this you know I kept looking for a reason not to not to malt, and I haven't, I haven't got there yet. So uh, yeah, it's my it's my exit strategy from the military. So yeah, for sure. Pretty good way to ETS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll we'll be all right. I'll keep drinking. So, <laughs> cool. Yeah. Well, listen, thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming out. Come and visit us on the web at basicbrewing.com. You can find archive lists of both our audio and video podcasts on home brewing. You can also find our DVDs, extract brewing and partial mashing, stepping into all grain, low tech lagering and decoction mashing, introduction to wine kits, and our basic brewing brewer's logbook where you can track and log up to 50 batches of beer. Drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you. Write to james at basicbrewing.com, steve at basicbrewing.com, or just use the contact form on basicbrewing.com. I'm one, <laughs> two, uh, okay, three. and...